Greetings, people of the world, people of the internet. Welcome to Scenes from the Lighthouse. If you're new here, thank you for joining me. Welcome. And for those of you who know me from my YouTube channel and my Twitch stream, I'm A1 Major. But for this video series, I like to keep it casual and personal. So you just call me Anthony. So today I want to share with you my thoughts regarding conditioning and free thought. Uh, I only started to make sense of these ideals five years ago and what led me to ponder these ideals was growing up in a Roman Catholic household. So my mother and father laid down strong fundamentals in our life and religion and we had to adhere to dogmas, tenets of faith, morals, certain kinds of behavior and anything else that fell under the codes of conduct that provided by the church and its greater community. So although this is my own perception and presentation of conditioning and free thought, uh, I did do some research and follow through with it uh, a few years ago just to further my understanding. I meant to do these um, vlogs a few years back, um, but Lacked, lacked any kind of inspiration, but recently uh, I found my way again. So that's why I'm here. I wish to share with you these things. Hopefully um, it's informative. Hopefully you get something out of it. Um, so yeah, uh, what I found for conditioning. Uh, there's actually two kinds of conditioning and um, one of them actually uh, rings true to me. And I'll be using uh, dogs as an example. It's very easy and you know a lot of people love dogs so it's an easy way to do it. Um, so there's two kinds of conditioning. There's classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And so in classical conditioning uh, there's usually like a natural reflex uh, depending on what it is. So for a natural reflex for a dog is if you put a plate of food, the natural reflex for the dog is to salivate because it's anticipating eating the food. But uh, with classical conditioning, you introduce a neutral stimulus that will stimulate the reflex. So to describe this, there's a Russian physiologist called Ivan Pavlov and he uh, was doing his re uh, research in digestive processes. He won a Nobel Peace Prize for uh, during the research. What he would do is him and his assistants would bring out uh, food for the canines uh, and test different kinds to see how they would salivate in response to the different kinds of food. Uh, however, during this research, he noticed that the dogs would salivate when he and his assistants entered the room, even if they didn't possess any food. And what he started to make as an association was that with the dogs would know that every time he and his assistants entered the room food would follow and so he realized that he became the stimulus for the dog's uh, natural reflex and in doing that he tried multiple things and the one i did research on was the metronome not that i won't go into too much detail but basically as you would expect, he played the metronome to the dogs and then followed by the metronome would give them food. And then over time, the dogs realized every time they heard the metronome tick, they would know food was coming. So they would salivate even if there was no food given to the dogs. So that's the basis for classical conditioning. Uh, operant conditioning, this is something that reflects in me. Um, operant conditioning is behavior change um, on reinforcement or punishment and so again with the dogs if you're trying to teach a d uh, dog to fetch a ball uh, if the dog is successful um, you may reward the dog uh, by either giving it praise or giving it a treat um, and if it's not successful you may hold off on giving it any kind of um, reward uh, you may even scold the dog lightly but um, eventually the dog will start to understand that 
in order to get praise or a treat, it can fetch the ball when the ball is thrown. And so that kind of um, that kind of punishment or reinforcement, depending, uh, is uh, what's known as operant conditioning. And so for me, I was conditioned through fear. Um, with my dad being strict. Now, in the 80s, it's a different time. Of course, it's, a de it's definitely a different time. Corporal punishment was a thing, obviously. I don't hear about it too much now, but... That was how it was. So for lack of a better phrase, don't do dumb shit and you won't get beat. That's pretty much it. And so that's how we learned. But, you know, it worked then. It's, again, it's a different time. Uh, a lot's changed. Every, you know, society goes through development changes. P people go through development changes. So it's no surprise that these kinds of ways of, you know, dealing have changed but that's how i was conditioned with fear there but also um i was conditioned in fear with what i can and can't do in regards to religion because everything felt as though if i do something wrong i'm going to get thrown into a pit of fire after i die and that's going to be a running theme through this because that's pretty much how I felt the entire time. And so, also free thought. So when I say free thought, I mean it in the philosophical viewpoint of free thought. So the viewpoint is which truths, personal truths, uh, however you want to look at it, are formed on the grounds of logic and reason. And they're usually devoid of authority, creed, uh, dogmas, or traditions so obviously just because something's been around for a hundred years and everyone's been doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's true just because of just because a religion tells you something doesn't mean it's true just because someone in a higher power tells you so obviously free thought is free from restriction most of the time so that's so that's where that's for me this is where i'm at right now but I will go over and explain um, things as we go. So obviously conditioning free thought uh, coupled with fundamental Catholicism provided me with conflicting thoughts and conflicting ideals. Um, as I was growing up, I didn't question them because every time I questioned them, I felt as though I was going to get thrown into a pit of fire because, you know, you're not supposed to question religion or whatever God said in stone for you don't do that and so I actively didn't do anything about it um, until my late 20s the only reason I started to do that was because I was starting to become more self-aware of who I who I am who I want to be and where I'm going in life but, you know as a child um, the church was shown to me through a lot of fear mongering it's changed quite a bit but back then you know it was a lot of you know you do this go to hell don't do this you know to win god's love you have to do all this stuff and whereas now when you go to services it's all about god is the god of love if you open your heart to him you know he will work through you and allow you to move mountains and achieve the great things in life and at the time that's all I knew because I wasn't allowed to do much as a child I had a sheltered life and we only ever hung around in our circles so my dad's friends and everyone there is uh, Catholic so I couldn't see anything different to our life. So that's what I accepted. But after I started to go to school and actually start to interact socially, again, I didn't really have many social skills due to the lack of, um, you know, exposure to it. But then when I started to realize that even though we were all at a Catholic school and everyone was acting different, I go, something is definitely up here. And that's my mind started to tick a lot. 
So, how this works for me at the basis. Um, if someone asks me a question, uh, it can be usually a tricky question. Uh, sometimes because they, if they know me personally, they're doing it to see me rant. Uh, the reason why they're wanting to see me rant is usually I have less of a filter. And they know that I have, I, they knew at the time that I had a lot of problems with expressing my own feelings because I would be heavily conflicted between my feelings and what the church says. Because obviously if I express my feelings and they don't mesh with the church, there's a problem. And obviously they didn't mesh. And so a lot of the times I would be hesitant to speak my mind because again, if I said something out of line, um, if someone from the, someone from our community heard, that'd be a problem. My dad would hear about it. Um, I would feel scared that, you know, God knows. So again, pit of fire. This, this whole thing, as you can see, it's a running thing. But the other times, if they were asking me a tricky question, uh, they were doing it because they wanted to see me slip up and fall. Not me personally. But because they wanted to, because usually if it was a question related to religion, it would be to explode, expose the flaws and the contradictory natures that you see on surface level. So, like I said, I'm my own person. I had my own, I had my own thoughts and things that were true to me, but in my mind, always a roadblock. And like I said, I'd have to justify the teachings, especially if what I think and what the church thinks doesn't mesh, and I'm part of that community. What does that say about me as a person? So internally, I would battle. I would say to myself, who are you? Are you your own person with your own thoughts? Or are you a yes man who follows the greater community like sheep and doesn't have, you know, a say of their own? So a question that I was asked the most once people knew I was a practicing Roman Catholic. And when I say practicing, uh, I mean that in the sense of I went to church on Sunday. I would say prayers with my family. Um, I would try and live by example so that if anyone would ever go, oh, okay, Anthony seems like a good guy. Let, why is that? Let's have a chat to him. That way I don't need to say that I'm Catholic. I don't need to do anything because I let my actions talk for me because that's more important than someone who says they're the greatest Catholic in the world but does nothing that reflects that. Like, um, during the time, like when I was becoming self-aware, I gained some friends that were vegan and to me, it, that was a new concept at the time. So I was highly intrigued and for me it was a real eye-opener because I was like I commend them for their passion I commend them for their cause because what I saw in them I didn't see in me and it was like they're hundred percent in they're all in and here I am going this is right but this isn't like the only reason I was saying this is right is Again, I'm afraid that if I slip up, I'm going to... So I'm following the church because I just don't want my afterlife to suffer. And But that's when I start to realize, well, if I'm not 100% in this, why am I in this? And so I started to think. But then also at the same time, what also brought this to mind to me is because, they, because they're so passionate, there's always those few people that have to ruin it for everyone because then they start throwing their beliefs on other people and saying, if you eat meat, you're the worst human because you're perpetuating all the problems that go with it, you know, animal trade problems, etc., etc., etc. I know I'm a Catholic, so I know all about Bible bashing. And I would tell these people, you know, worse. Like, you know better than the Bible bashers, you're actually worse. Why are, why do you see all over the place, vegans are brunt of jokes, and Catholics are brunt of jokes. Why? 
if something happens multiple times, I don't think that it's completely fake. Bible bashers are terrible because they take one small passage in the Bible, run with it, and then tell people that they're going to go to hell. That if they don't repent from their sins, judgment day is coming. And I'm like thinking, well, you don't know anything. No one cares about your cause if you're an asshole. That's pretty much all it is. You can be the nicest. You can you can uh, have a hundred percent passion. You can want to show everything, but no one will care if how you go about it is the worst. And that's what I learned from that situation. But yeah, anyway, let's go and back. Abortion. Woo, woo, woo. Trigger trigger signs warnings. Stay away. Of course, there, it's a very, it's a very tricky, a very loaded and heavy question because the church's views, there's, there's always these things. And for me personally, I knew straight up, deep down, I knew. I don't know what, like that woman's got their own body and it's their choice. I don't have a say on the matter. No one has a say on the matter. I don't, like, outside of that, I don't need to know. But the problem is, the church is all pro-life. Once once, once um, it hits conception, it's a life. If you do anything, you kill. And so, again, let's see if, let's see if Anthony, Mr. Nice Guy, has a response to this. So, yeah, I'd be conflicted. Um, but I would, in that situation, I would give my response. But I'd, I'd give two responses. And that's kind of terrible, but because I'm not, I'm not convinced by it either. Like I'm stuck in the middle somewhere. My dad being, my dad being and my dad and not really putting into perspective things. Uh, he, when I was, it was, I was under 10, he sat us down and watched the documentary on abortion. It was graphic and, you know, shock value. Um, and yeah it scared the absolute shit out of me because it's just like well i don't want any part of it and it's it was just the whole idea of like if someone was to do that i'm supposed to tell them that's wrong you know again this whole um conditioning by fear i i don't understand i didn't want to know i i don't need to know things like this like let's say if we someone asked me what's happening in the world right now I don't know. I've got some idea. Maybe I'm ignorant. Maybe I'm naive. But a lot of the time, the reason why I'm not paying that close attention is I can't do anything about it. Like, I can't go and fight in every war. I can't feed all the hungry people. You know, I can't stop a lot of oppressions. Um, these things just bring me down because then I then I start to go to my old thinking. I'm very positive. I start to go to my old thinking where all I said back then was the world is a pile of shit and the people on it are flies buzzing over it because no one, like, people don't work together to solve problems. I don't want to think like that. I'm pretty positive. But at the same time, I can't do everything. And so a lot of the time I don't need to know. Like I said, maybe I'm ignorant, maybe I'm naive, but I feel, as cliche as this sounds, if people want to see a change, they have to change themselves. They have to make themselves better people. Eventually they might find like-minded individuals, but even finding like-minded individuals who have the same cause, because people are different, naturally there's going to be... Um, you know, compromises that have to be made. And if those things aren't made, well, we're still back in the same situation. So that's how I feel. Maybe I just don't need to know about specific things. And on the surface level, that's it. That's that's why I said why, in my opinion. Again, the, ch the church. Let's go pick it around the clinics. Why are you going to pick it around the clinics? They see it in this square, but they don't realize that it's attached to so many different things. Did you ever go and ask the women there what their situation is? 
Were they the victims of abuse? What was the cause? What even had them have to make a decision that got them to that point? Again, very loaded and very heavy. And, you know, of course, people would always ask me, but I know straight up. If, it, if my opinion's wrong, that's my opinion. And that's what I believe. And that's pretty much how I see it. But, you know, I've had people tell me that's not a good way to think. I've had people tell me that's a good way. It's not set. I think it's just best to make up your own damn mind. You know, when you're a child, you, you play, you fall, you hurt yourself, you probably cry, or you probably have a shout of pain, but you continue to play. You get up, you continue to play. Because at the time, fear is not there for you. Nothing's been taught to you. You're not conditioned. Nothing, nothing is set in stone for you yet. You're just like, what is this new feeling? But as you grow and you're learning and, you know, absorbing things like a sponge, you're being slowly told what you can and can't do. And that you're conditioned as you grow. And I feel as though it's weird because once, at least for me, from my perspective is, I'm getting conditioned as I grow, but as I get to a certain age, I'm trying to reverse everything. It's like now if I fall over, I put my hands out. But if I put my hands out when I'm breaking my fall, sometimes that does more damage to my wrists than if I was just to take a fall and maybe get a bruise or a, a slight cut. Then my hands, then I can't use my hands for a while. Whereas as a kid, I would just fall straight over. Eh, I think it's funny. I, I think it's just an interesting situation from that point. So, another experience for me is conditioning by fear was backmasking. So if anyone doesn't know what backmasking is, uh, backmasking is on vinyl. If you play a record in reverse, um, there's a message on there. There's two forms of backmasking. If you one that's actually deliberately recorded on there. And the other form is where the phonetics of the word spoken will indirectly form a message. Maybe it will sound a bit co incoherent and it's a bit of a stretch to um, make up what the words are, but that's there. So again, again, my dad, hilariously, all around this time, I think it was again before 10, maybe I was like nine years old, something like that. Sat us down and we watched a documentary called Hell's Bells. Uh, Hell's Bells, you know, AC, if any ACDC fans out there would know, what a great title for a documentary about how heavy metal and rock and roll is all terrible and you shouldn't listen to anything at all. But what I remember from that is there's two songs, so Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. That one has a message recorded on the back. Like, if you play it backwards, that's a satanic message. But again, I did some research on this, like, maybe five years ago. And I don't know if the message is super coherent, but it pretty much says that if you follow Satan, you'll be sad. So... On the surface level, again, don't listen to it. The satanic message, but did they actually pay attention to the message or try to decipher it at least? No, nah, I don't know. I don't understand. And the other one that I remember is Queen's Another One Bites the Dust. Another One Bites the Dust with the phonetics backwards. Again, it's a bit of a stretch, but again, they said it's fun to smoke marijuana. So, of course, don't, don't, drugs are bad. You know, these kinds of things are bad. So don't don't listen. Everything's out. Everything is no more. You cannot listen. I didn't care. I listened to a lot of that stuff. Because I feel as though for me it was what you get out of it. And you know, if you're if you're if you're you know in a positive state of mind and what you're getting out of it, how can that be bad? I don't know. It just felt as though everything we came across we couldn't do. And then it was super limiting. And because it was super limiting, I always wanted to do what 
what was opposite. I always wanted to do what was opposite. Which is probably the reason why. I don't know if that's really the... If if it's because I was so restricted that I wanted to change everything, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm a massive Metallica fan. Like... I know most I know most of the catalog the catalog back to front. But I do remember when the black album came out. I was told you can't listen to Metallica. And I'm like thinking, why? Because there's a song on the album called The God That Failed. So James Hetfield, the lead singer, he wrote the songs about his mother passing away from, you know, cancer. And it's because in Christian science you're supposed to put your your faith in the Lord and anything that happens it happens as a result even if there's even if the doctors can help you you're not allowed to get help that way and so his the reason he wrote that song was just out of frustration and anger so that's just his experience in life and i feel as though if you're going to deny him of that just because it doesn't um, put, just because it puts your own situation in a bad light. I mean, if the church is going to try and attack everything every time something of something of the church is actually put in a bad light, it will get tiring after a while. I'll get tired. I get tired of trying to defend Catholicism all the time. At the end of the day, I just push on and continue because I feel as though no matter what cause you're in. Or what kind of movement you're in. It's going to happen a lot. People are going to come up and question you a lot. But the problem is I got tired of trying to defend it. Because it was more defending than people accepting. And so I found that to be a catalyst as well. And I'm like thinking there's something not quite right here. But I mean like if you're not going to listen to things. If you're not going to take in a lot of things and everything is, you know, bad to religion. How do you receive new perspectives? How do you have a, like, do you just have a closed mind the entire time? How do you grow? I mean, if people don't want to have an open mind, that's fine too. That's their life. They can choose whatever they want to do. But I find that to be quite restrictive. See, I don't recall when I started to ponder a specific notion, like some kind of an epiphany where I was thinking, God gave me a brain. I've been giving this remarkable way of thinking so that I can question my surroundings. It'd be silly to go through life to just accept everything that's been given to you. You'll never ask questions you'll never ask how does this work what's this purpose you know why did that person do that oh that seems like an interesting prospect let me try the idea and the process of learning something different and something outside the confines of where you are is a beautiful and magical thing So yeah, that's, I don't know, like, to have a limit placed on things is frustrating to me. I feel as though I'm not getting anywhere. So I started to question and would wonder why my personal thoughts would conflict with what I have been taught. As I said earlier, the theme continues. If I do something wrong, then I'm thrown into a pit of fire. You know... If I speak ill of my friend, I'm going to hell. If I don't repent my sins, I'm going to hell. Everything pointed to the fiery furnace. But I believe that if you do something wrong and you are genuinely sorry for it and it's something close to your heart and you're truly sorry for it and you try and make up for it later, you don't need anyone to tell you if you're doing anything right or wrong. That's enough. I said this a while ago. I think it's silly that people can commit sins, run off to the priest, say they're sorry and run off and do the exact same thing. They didn't learn anything. 
the whole system is a sham if that's the case. But I believe that if you feel sorry for it genuinely and you try to better yourself, that's worth more than telling someone about it and then just going off and doing it again. You know, but you know, if you brought up with common sense, common codes of conduct and how you're supposed to be like around other people, then you don't need to know, you don't need to be told what's right and wrong. You know what you're doing is right and wrong. And if people start to tell you what you're doing is right and wrong on that level, and they're trying to bring your life down, then they're placing themselves in a position of utmost power and think that they're gods. And I don't, and I don't for the life of me believe that there's anyone on this planet who has that power. And if they tell you, even though I said everything about conditioning and free thought, I can't accept it. <laughs> I can't accept it. That's, that's, that's me. Like I just, if you throw everything I've said out the window, I can't accept it. Cause normally, normally I'm quite rational, but in that sense, no. So when I look through the Bible, Jesus is the nicest guy. He doesn't judge anyone. He never places the blame. He's always trying to make the outcast feel welcome. If this is the case, I couldn't help wonder why when I was growing up, was there so many problems with the LGBT community? And for people that don't know, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. So the church led me to believe that their sexual orientation was an affront to God. There was a great divide that I couldn't understand. It never made sense to me. So as we're going through this whole Catholic process, we go through catechism and catechism is like an instruction manual for the sacraments. And the sacraments are like rites of passage. And so for people who don't know, that's baptism. So most people know what that is. It's like a christening. Uh, you've got the confirmation. Confirmation is like um, you're of a mature age and you are accepting of God. Reconciliation is the act of what I said earlier about repenting your sins. Uh, the Eucharist is like the body and blood of Christ. Holy orders. So if you want to become a priest, deacon, brother, nun. Uh, marriage. So obviously get married. Uh, anointing of the sick so if you're if you know that like let's say you've been diagnosed and the doctor said you've only got a certain time to live uh, you get a special right to you know bless you before you pass because at that stage you probably don't know how long you got so what was taught to us in catechism is there's is that anything other than heterosexuality was objectively disordered and what they mean by Ordered? Um, let's use an example. So a seed. I mean, it's just this is general. So a seed is ordered to become a tree. You plant the you plant the seed in the ground, you nurture it, grows and becomes a tree. So when you take sexuality and what's it what it's ordered to do in the scheme of uh, Catholicism, it's love and having children. And so you can see where there is a divide because homosexuality is not, doesn't have a specific end. Yes, there's love, but the act of, you know, the sexual act doesn't lead to children or anything like that. So it's deemed disordered because there's no specific end to it. It's part of natural, natural law. I think it's something to do with that. So it also states in catechism, under no circumstances can they be approved. But they are specific and they say that it's the orientation. So they're not actually calling people who are homosexual objectively disordered. How, how terrible does that sound? But the thing was, what wasn't taught to us at the time, and I again, I had to do research on this. And when, you know, when I looked it up, it says that there's no unjust discrimination 
and it should be avoided. And everyone should be treated with virtues of respect, compassion and sensitivity. No one's excluded. I don't know why we weren't taught that, but then that pretty much overrides the other shit that's said in the catechism about the objectively disordered. But I think what it does, I think the reason why it doesn't completely override it is because what it says is, even though they're not allowed to, you know, even though what they're doing is not right, you shouldn't discriminate them. So it's kind of not counterbalancing, it's just don't discriminate because you're not, it's not like, it's you're not in the position of power to do that. But I still think it's a mess. So if God created us in his own image, that means he created everyone, me, you, the gay people, the straight people, those that don't know who or what they are, then who am I to say what's right and wrong? If he created everyone, wouldn't he be happy about his own creation? Why would he send those people to hell? Personally, I don't understand how simple rules that Jesus says. Maybe I'm simplifying it too much. Like if you follow the simple rules. Two, two commandments. Love God as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The second one is simple common sense. Love your neighbor love your neighbor as yourself is pretty much just don't be a dick to people and just get by. Everyone's just trying to get a get you know, trying to make their way in the world. That's people don't need any more problems. Just be kind you know, just go about your life and be kind to people. That's it's pretty much it. So as you can see, I I I'll very very frustrated. I don't have a problem with anyone. Which is why this whole thing is annoying, because it was stated there in catechism, and then I'm like thinking, well, we're not supposed to. If Jesus is having dinner with all the outcasts and making them feel welcome, shouldn't we do the same? I even hear it from my father as well. Oh, I love them, but what they do is wrong. It's like an oxymoron saying to me, and something I couldn't fathom. I couldn't understand why you would make something just to throw it away. Well, that's the limited part of my thinking. I'm, un I'm unable to comprehend how a deity operates. Like if I was to create the world, then I would want everything that I created to succeed and make its way, its own way, find its own path and, be, and marvel at what it's doing. Especially if I've given it a brain to, to think and be able to do things that are unfathomable. Every time I come across new people, I'm like, wow, look at what this person's done. I go, I didn't even know some of the things that people have done. I learned so much shit every day. It's absolutely astounding. So I couldn't understand this. I, yeah, yeah, as you can see. So another thing I was not fond of either. God's planned out our life before we've done it. So it's like playing with toy soldiers when you think about it. Wouldn't that be boring? If you knew exactly what's going to happen before it happened, wouldn't that take the fun out of it? Again, limitation of human understanding. There's so much in the world that I've yet to understand. I can't begin to fathom something like this. But I can't accept it either. Like if you throw logic and reason out the window, I'm, I just, I just can't accept it. I think it's all a load of shit. I don't want to know what happens in my right, my life. I don't. I'd rather not know. That's the point. A long time ago, I spoke about the unknown. I love the fact that there is the unknown. It's supposed to create the feeling of angst before you enter that which is unknown, whatever that may be. If you're having a new experience, if you're going to speak to a new person, if you're going to, uh, you know, try something completely new, whatever that is, 
You're supposed to have those butterflies in your stomach. You don't know. That's the whole point. To make the unknown known, you have to go and experience it. Then you can marvel at what kind of emotions it gives you because it's something completely new. I do not understand why that's the case. And if that's the case, well, <laughs> you know, God's plan. Yeah. So I also have an issue with the standard nine to five jobs. So I've got so many, so many problems with everything. But only from the perspective of if I've been taught to do something and if my team leader, supervisor or anyone in charge uh, leads me to my devices, then I'm good. But if someone's in the back staring over my shoulder, arms crossed, it makes me, it makes it difficult for me to do what I naturally can do. And it makes me feel like I'm not doing my job right. Because why would they be there? And this is the same thing in religion for me. I don't like the fact that there is some person, a higher power, looking down. And the moment that I make a mistake, then I get in trouble for it. Unless I go and, unless I'm sorry for it. And, you know, make amends. It's like, it's a very, it's a, that kind of fear onset didn't sit well with me. And I knew something was not entirely right about this. So naturally I spoke to people all walks of life. Went through a lot of emotions, picked apart my brain. At this moment in time, the walls in my mind have been broken down and I can think freely and speak my mind without hesitation. But what I do appreciate from, from all this is coming from a religious household is first is um, the first hand experience. So I can clearly see it from that perspective. One thing I always say and will say a thousand more times is that experience outweighs recollections of thoughts of what people say. And the fact that I get to see it like what it's like when people when I tell people that I'm Catholic and they're not accepting of it, I get to see it from both sides. And that makes me have more respect for everything really. And I'm glad that it's from this side because now that I go over it now, like the fact that I'm not even bothering. I know more about it and I know more than some people would. So when I deal with the situations, I have more respect. So I mentioned conditioning that made me afraid to th think freely. Like I said that I'm, I'm like, I'm able to think freely now. But what also made me afraid to do things for the same reason. Dad saying no. Dad will always say no. So much so that even though I knew he would say no, I would spend hours and weeks building up the courage to go ask him to do something very, very simple, knowing that he'd say no, but just on the odd chance, but it would still take me that much time because all I could think of in my head is he's going to say no, don't bother. He's going to continue to say no, always say no, don't, don't go anywhere. He's just going to continue to say no. You know, I want to go to the shops with my brother. No, I want, I just want to go on my own, but my brother has to come with me. I want to go visit my friend, but I can't. So there was this one time I do remember. Um, one of my friends who I usually would um, talk to on the bus rides home from school, who was from a neighboring school, but we would talk on the way back, who lived a two minute walk up the road from my house. One one time he one time on the weekend he invited me over, and I asked my I asked my dad, but obviously no. But he had his friends over, 
So I was like, I'm going to make it. I made a scene and stormed off to my room. My dad is considered like one of the nicest guys and one of the most respected people in his friends because, you know, being a Catholic, he's just seen as one of those people. But, you know, to save face, I didn't know if he was going to, but to save face, he, you know, can't let that slide. I, I figured he was going to come into the room and let me have it. But he actually came in and he's like, you really want to go? I'm like, yeah. So he let me go. But again, it was one of those situations. And that carried over to life. Like, you wouldn't believe. I lacked confidence for such a long time. And it was very difficult for me to do a lot of easy things. Because, you know, um, I lacked any kind of independence in that regard. It was very, very difficult for me to do a lot of things, but I broke that down and it took me a long time to get to where I am now. And it's not that straightforward. I think um, it's quite it's quite interesting, really. Uh, not too long ago, I was having a discussion with someone and they go to me, how did you make peace with your upbringing and the way your father was and I'm like well it's not easy like I'm not totally going to defend everything he's ever done but the way I made peace was it was after I realized that me and my father don't speak about um, personal things and that's obviously the result because our lineage comes down from um, being, you know, descendants of Armenians that were part of the genocide in 1914. And so showing emotion, you can't show emotion. You get killed. You need to be tough. In those times, that's it. It's all about survival. There's no time for doing stuff like that. And so that obviously carried on from generation to generation. And so... Dad, Dad would never show strong emotion. I would never really know what that's like. And it was very difficult for me to even um, think about things like that. Or to even fathom to go up to him and talk about something um, personal. But before he passed, after, after he was diagnosed with cancer, I actually had a chat to him about stuff like this. And I think at that point I made peace but it wasn't as easy. And the, my reasoning is parenthood, there's no real instruction manual. And also when I was saying that about the, the vegans and their passion, for my dad, religion, it's 100% his life. There was no ifs and buffs. You can tell straight up that he was in it completely. And so for him, he thinks that that's he believes that that's right and for him that's his that's his truth and so he's obviously going to pass that down to his children and he just wants the best for his children and that's what he believes so of course that's going to happen there's no manual he's trying to make do with what he's got and if i if i constantly use all the things that's happened as a means of, um, you know, as an excuse, I'm not going to ever take charge of my life. At some point, I have to live my own life. And so I made peace with the fact that not everyone's perfect and everyone's just trying to do what they know is best and pass it on and try and be a positive role model for people. And in the end, I believe that I learned a lot of positive things from my father. And I'm more appreciated, more appreciative of that than I am of the negative things. Because in turn, the negative things made me a lot stronger. But that was for me to work through. And if that was my test, I don't believe in superstitions or cliches when people go, that's what you've been put through. Ah, uh, I don't think so. But that's, that's my thought on that, even though a lot of the fear that I've been put through, I had to reverse all came from my dad. I don't think he intended for it to be that way. So that's the reason why I made peace with the situation. 
my closing thoughts. So free thought, I'm all of, I'm always about free thought. I can't assume that other people are on the same wavelength, but for me, free thought. I love to go into situations and know everyone's uh, view is different, and that I can take everything in, and take everything in, and then take what I need from it, and then form my own opinion and be and. Um, you know, I may receive some kind of enlightenment about a perspective I never fathomed that existed before. That could inspire me to think in a new way. Or a thought process that strengthens the way I think already. Or people who have common values, but approach them in an offbeat manner. Something that's different to me. It's probably completely normal to them, but to me, it's completely offbeat. All those that I disagree with, and that everything that I say, and they don't, they don't have anything, they don't like anything that I say from the ground up. There is always something to take away from any given moment. If someone gives me praise, if someone gives me hate, if someone criticizes my actions, if someone questions my life, what makes this all amazing for me is that I have the ability to take it all in and accept it for what it is. I add it to my ever-changing growing and growing mind. Rather than have my own set of ideals and block everything out because it's all wrong for me. That's not a way to go through life. Well, personally, I don't feel like it. Well, that's no, there's no joy in life that way. The go through closed off. I know it can be extremely difficult to tell your friends what they're doing is right or wrong. Sometimes you don't know if what, if you should be telling them anyway. I welcome it. I may not appear to take criticism well, but I appreciate someone willing to be that honest with me. Please tell me if there is something that I may be doing that's not sitting well with you. And see what can be done about it. It's not easy. Things like this are never easy. Even if you hold back on saying things like this, they may explode when the friendships and relationships start to get rocky. And you know, especially when friendships and relationships are in need of care and attention, sometimes those things just come out because you've just been holding off for so long. But I'm a great advocate of free thought. And right now I'm content with how I think about life and how I approach my situations. It's a beautiful and amazing thing. But that's it for me today, guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you for staying for this entire time. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, if you have any thoughts on the matter, please let me know. I'll do my best to get back to you. I do like to discuss these kinds of things. So if, you, if there's any points, whether you like them or you don't, if, you, if anything that I said did not agree, please let me know. And as usual, do, the, do what everyone else does. Like the page. Like the, like the video. Comment, subscribe. Everything. I appreciate it. This is Anthony. This is the scenes from the lighthouse. And I'm signing out. Peace and love. Take care, guys.